I presented this talk at the Kentucky Orthopedic Society geared toward the University of Louisville and University of Kentucky residents and also the faculty that attended the meeting October 2017 at the Galt House. The talk is entitled Sports Medicine Through the Arthroscope and Camera, 30 Years of Practice. This is my experience over the last three decades. I am Mary Lloyd Ireland, professor at the University of Kentucky, orthopedic surgeon. So what's happened in the generation that I've been in practice? Prior to 1985, this was when I was a resident, what we were able to do is extra-articular reconstructions. We couldn't address the anatomic injury and put it back because we didn't have the equipment nor the visualization. So before arthroscopy, we did things open. Extra-articular reconstructions of the shoulder, subscapularis transfers, coracoid transfers, capsular shifts. Sounds familiar to now 2017 in that we're doing a lot of this arthroscopic or arthroscopically aided with many open techniques. So back then, our coracoid transfers were a bristo. Now it's a ladder J which is a variation of a coracoid transfer. Sometimes we use the coracoid. More than often, we use the, an allograft. And also, we address the capsule and repair the capsule back anatomically and then use that bone transfer technique in severe anterior instability cases. What about the knee? We did IT band tenodeses and medial repairs for ACL, MCL, knee dislocations, another popular procedure was a pes anserine transfer popularized by the orthopedist in Oregon many, many years ago. This was done in an extra articular. We didn't really address the ACL at all. Knees got stiff. They didn't remain unstable. They, we stabilized the knee, but they were stiff. And so when you have a 10 degree flexion contracture of the knee, the knee will develop arthritis even though it is stabilized. And now look in 2017, we're back to IT band tenodeses. There are different techniques that can be used, but this is being used as a backup for a failed ACL reconstruction, and basically we do an anatomic ACL reconstruction with a graft of choice, usually the patient's own tissues, bone patellar tendon bone, quad tendon, or hamstrings. Put it in the right place, but there are certain patients who may need more lateral stability Usually repairs don't work of the AAL, ALL if that exists. So we do some form of a tenodesis, again, extra articular to reduce the pivot shift. What about the ankle? Today we try to address the capsule, address the ligaments directly, doing modified brostrum repairs, which is more of an anatomic reconstruction. Prior to the mid-80s, we did a lot of perineus brevis transfers. This stabilized the ankle, but it was extra-articular and actually over-constrained the subtalar joint, and some people got too stiff and developed subtalar osteoarthritis. So after 1985, anatomic repairs and reconstruction were started via arthrotomy, then arthroscopy, and the arthroscope paved the way for advances in surgical techniques and understanding mechanism injury, particularly in the shoulder when we made diagnoses of slap tears, labrum tears, and prior to the early 80s, we didn't really understand the labrum and how it is injured in the throwing athlete. So we started doing scopes, figured it out, and went back to the mechanisms of injury. So these are some pictures when I was a fellow at the Houston Clinic in 1985. Upper left is an arthritic varus knee, medial compartment gonarthrosis, and you can see this bone on bone. What did we have available in the 1980s? Dr. Houston popularized this high tibial osteotomy, which we did a closing wedge, high tibial osteotomy, took a piece of bone out, put them into valgus, was the so-called Coventry method. 
described by Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon. But what we fixed it with, we just had a third tubular plate, bent it, and put a big screw in, and that was our fixation. You look now, we have a lot of different graphs that we can use to do now our opening medial wedge osteotomy instead of a closing. And we can put in synthetic bone graft, a lot of different fixation techniques, which are very expensive, much more expensive than our third tubular plate and a big screw. We've come a long way from extraarticular to intraarticular anatomic reconstructions. We did a lot of manipulations in the 80s where people got too stiff. This is shown in the lateral side on the upper uh, left here. So this was our IT band tenodesis. This person got very stiff, so we're doing an examiner anesthesia and a closed manipulation. We didn't scope them, now we would rescope them. So he got much better range of motion after the manipulation. This was an arthroscopy, so we took out scar tissue, arthroscopy, and then did the manipulation. And then this is a very huge hunk of ectopic bone from medial collateral ligament pull-off off the femur, Pellegrini steata syndrome. Stiff knees, and we have come a long way with emphasizing range of motion, regaining range of motion, and I think we're doing a much better job with anatomic reconstructions. This is an individual with a knee dislocation. We don't see this a lot, but it is still missed in our ERs. If you have someone who has an exam on the field that opens up in extension, varus or valgus, you've got to think ACL, PCL, and a knee dislocation. And in those cases, you do want to get them to an emergency room that can assess their vascular status. So this was a football athlete who had a valgus blow. You can see in the upper right, this is a positive suck sign that we coined. So the skin is actually sucked into the joint because that's all what is attaching. Only the skin is stabilizing him medially. Had an ACL tear, PCL tear. After making a skin incision, no further dissection was necessary. This is the meniscus that's in the breeze there. The deep capsular ligaments, meniscofemoral, meniscotibial, superficial tibial collateral ligament are all detached from the meniscus. So do a direct repair of that. ACL reconstruction with bone patellar tendon bone autograft. And we did repair the PCL back to the femur. And the patient did very well. So when you see dimpling of the skin on your exam on the field, you got to think, Nothing's left here. Patients don't hurt if they have a complete dislocation, typically acutely, because there's no distension of the joint possible with the hemarthrosis because everything leaks out. As you can think here, there's nothing to contain the, the blood, so there's no pain. So what's the arthroscopic view in 1990? This is what it looked like. You young orthopedic surgeons should be very happy and blessed. Look back at some of these pictures. We were able to do arthroscopy, but it was a bit more painful to do because we couldn't see very well. So this is our shaver in the 1990s. And then this is osteoarthritis of the patella and trochlear groove. We did more aggressive removal of spurs and debridement in those days, but they got stiff. So we now know that arthroscopy for arthritis is not indicated and patients don't do well. Uh, there are indications for arthroscopy in arthritis if they're loose bodies, and sometimes people can have a lot of arthritis and do very well. So this is our uh, Lanny Johnson Schlesinger clamp to remove a big loose body. And then this is arthrofibrosis. This is a burr, so we did do abrasion chondroplasties in those days, hoping that we would get better ingrowth of articular cartilage, but again, that didn't work, so we don't do these procedures anymore. And if you look at it, it's kind of hard to see, but we got through it and we did a good job in those early days of arthroscopy. This was in 2000, debridement of a stiff knee, arthrofibrosis. Uh, you can see all the synovial tissue, the scar in these. Um, the scar comes from synovium. Fat pad becomes very fibrotic. 
And so, again, an aggressive removal of all this tissue and a manipulation is done. Fortunately, we're not having to do as many of these because we don't see arthrofibrosis, perhaps because we've changed our prehab, work on range of motion, get the knee more silent and normal before operating on them. More to come on what the biochemical reasons, genetic reasons for arthrofibrosis of any joints. This is a picture of the notch using a rear entry guide for a ACL revision that was done in 1990. Here's the screw from the previous ACL. So you have to find a way to have a different angle on your femoral tunnel. Obviously this one was way too central or too vertical, but we used a rear entry guide and there are others that are, have been developed now that are guide systems where you can go outside in or inside out. When you're doing revisions, you need this. This is still a good way to find your spot for a revision. And this shows the rear entry guide and the pin coming in. Not the greatest view, but that's what we had. And you young orthopedists are somewhat spoiled because we've got greater views and a lot better equipment. Hunter in 1743 stated with articular cartilage, as you can see down here in the right, once violated articular cartilage defects are a troublesome thing, they don't heal. So we're still trying to develop ways of early diagnosis and how to treat these. Microfracture isn't working in large defects. More research to come and advances in hopefully getting this able to heal in a way arthritis does not occur. It's a bad day when you have an ACL reconstruction and you have this big large defect. What do you do with that? As of now we do a microfracture knowing that that will not give us the best articular cartilage nor normal collagen type, but that's what we start with and push range of motion, limit their weight bearing for four to six weeks. This is my website. If you'd like to go to the website, it has presentations and publications, web links, other readings, and some of my passion of photography is on there too, so enjoy. Website is myname.com. Thank you very much. Waterbucks, the end.